Well, um, hi everyone and welcome. I'm Jemima Steinfeld, editor of Index on Censorship magazine, of which you all have a copy on your chair. For those who aren't familiar with us, we are an organization that campaigns for freedom of expression. We've been around now for 50 years and at the heart of ours is the magazine. Before I get properly going, I want to actually firstly thank the Institute of Historical Research for kindly offering this room for our magazine launch and making this event possible. And I also want to thank you all for coming because it's very cold outside. <laughs> and I've already had one cancellation for a landslide on a train, so, so yeah, thank you. Um, just before I introduce the panel and note on tonight's format, I'm going to There'll be the introductions for about five minutes, and then Philip is going to do a presentation on the freedom of information landscape, which is really pivotal to the broader story. After that, I'm going to be asking questions. We'll talk for about 40 minutes, and then I'm going to open up to the audience for 20 minutes, and then there'll be a drinks reception after. So first off is Professor Philip Murphy. He's the Director of History and Policy here at the Institute. He's a Professor of British and Commonwealth History at the University of London and is also Joint Editor of the Journal of Imperial and Commonwealth History. Philip joined the School of Advanced Study in 2009 as Director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and he's also the Principal Investigator on the Windrush Scandal in a transnational and Commonwealth context. My, to my right, <laughs> immediate right, is Anna Whitelock, who is a historian, author, and broadcaster. She is Professor of the History of Monarchy at City University of London and Director of the Centre for the Study of Modern Monarchy. Anna is an international media commentator on monarchy, public history and heritage, and the Tudors and Stuarts. And in the middle is Anne Sever, who is a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, a biographer, lecturer, journalist, former Reuters foreign correspondent, and author of 11 books, she read history at King's College London, and her first job was at the BBC World Service in the Arabic department. Her biography, That Woman, The Life of Wallace Simpson, Duchess of Windsor, quickly became a bestseller on publication in Britain in August 2011, as well as in Australia and the US followed public, following publication in 2012. And it became the subject of a Channel 4 TV documentary. So we have an illustrious panel, all who bring a lot of experience to what we're about to talk about. So, Philip, do you want to kick off with your presentation? Yeah, thank you, Jemima, and, and thank you very much. And it's, it's a great pleasure to be working with Index on Censorship uh, on this. And I hope it's the, uh, the, the beginning of much longer collaboration on this very important topic. I thought, I thought it might be useful um, just to, to very quickly outline what the, the sort of the legal framework is the changing legal framework around the, the release of oral documents. Um, uh, just to get that sort of clear in our minds for, for the discussion. And it's been a shifting landscape. And that's part of the problem, that you've had different kind of regimes of document release. Uh, and they overlap. So, I mean, basically, where do, we, where do we start? We start with the 1958 Public Record Act, of course, which sets up the obligation of departments to pass records to the, the, the public record office and the National Archives. Um, initially, the assumption was that papers would be released 50 years after the, the moment of their generation, broadly speaking. That was changed in 1967. It was reduced to 30 years. But for certain categories of, of document, which were regarded as particularly sensitive, uh, like the, the Royal Family and the intelligence services, there were much longer periods of closure. Um, for correspondence about the Royal Family, it was the standard uh, closure was 100 years. That was relaxed slightly, or rather it was tweaked in 1972. It's a, bit, a rare bit of correspondence with the palace about this. So the, the, the subject was sort of broken up. Um, uh, Papers on the royal family itself, which might be regarded as sensitive, uh, continue to be closed for 100 years. Papers on things like the, the, the title royal styles, royal styles, more constitutional issues, uh, it was reduced to 75 years, and the palace agreed to that, and this is Martin Chartres, 
1972 agreeing to, um, to that slight change. The real game changer for, for contemporary historians was the, the, the 1993 Open Government White Paper. Read what it says. It says, records relating to the royal family will be treated in the same way as other records and only closed for longer than 30 years if they fall into one of three criteria governing closure. Now, those criteria were very, very narrow in a sense. Uh, they were A, census records, census uh, returns, um, B, uh, documents that might identify uh, victims of sexual crimes, and, and C, I mean, it's quite, it's quite broad, but, but also um, relatively specific, um, personally sensitive information which would substantially distress or endanger individuals or their descendants. Now this was, you know, uh, so this was a real game changer. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the Socialist Workers Party passing this. It was the, it was the Conservative government of John Major. Um, when the, the palace's fortunes were sort of sl at a slightly low ebb, you know, the Annas Horablis and all that. But it was part of a much broader conversation, really, between historians and government, saying, look, we know we're holding back a lot of stuff, which is just ridiculous, and, and you know what it is. So let's have a sensible conversation. Um, and actually, that became the regime that governed the release of papers under the 30-year rule from, you know, 94 to 2005. And so, what you get in the National Archives now is quite a lot of very interesting files on the royals from the mid-60s to the mid-70s. And then paradoxically, with the Freedom of Information Act, the shutters come down again because the palace panics. So what the, the 2000 Freedom of Information Act, which came into law in 2005, did, they created an exemption around correspondence with the royal household. But that had a public interest. Um, uh, it could be overridden in the public interest. So you can make public interest appeals against that. Incidentally, what the censors were already doing uh, from 2005 in order to get round that was closing and redacting papers to do with the Queen on the basis of exemptions 40 relating to personal information and 41 relating to information providing confidence, which didn't have a public interest appeal against them. So it was rather, it was trying to get round the system already. Um, but what, what sort of, what forced the government into a sort of a further retreat was of course uh, Rob Evans in 2005. Um, applying to see 27 pieces of correspondence between Prince Charles and, and government. Um, uh, and uh, Evans' uh, application was upheld by a special information tribunal in 2012 on the basis that this correspondence was advocacy correspondence and that it was in the public interest for people to know about that. Dominic Grieve, the Attorney General, immediately overturned that, but uh, Grieve's actions were declared illegal um, by the Court of Appeal in 2014. That was upheld in 2015 by the Supreme Court, and those so-called Black Spider memos were released, and they're available on the Cabinet Office website. And of course, they're, you know, they, they're actually quite interesting. For example, there's a, a letter from Charles to Tony Blair uh, in September 2004 um, about the army not being provided with replacements for Lynx aircraft. And Charles says, um, I fear this is just one more example of where our armed forces are being asked to do an extremely challenging job, particularly in Iraq, without the necessary resources. <coughs> No, I mean, it, it strikes me that there is a clear public interest in people knowing about that. I mean, A, because you see 
the royal family actually lobbying on behalf of the, the armed forces over a very sort of sensitive issue. But B, in a way, the recklessness of it. Imagine that getting into the Daily Mail in 2004, at the height of the Iraq war. Charles, Charles claims Blair isn't providing our troops with the necessary equipment. So, it, it, you know, that was, there was clearly a public interest, but even before uh, Evans' uh, application had succeeded, the government had changed the legislation. So in 2009, when they announced a reduction of the 30-year rule to the 20-year rule, they also announced that this exemption 37 for correspondence for the royal household would be made an absolute exemption. There would be no appeal for correspondence relating to the monarch and the first and the second in line to the throne. And so that's basically what we have now. It was incorporated uh, in the 2010 Constitutional Reform Government Act so that uh, correspondence uh, with the sovereign uh, or the heir to the throne, the person second in line of succession to the throne, a person who subsequently come to the throne will become heir uh, second in line to the throne. Uh, that is not available and will not be available until uh, 20 years have passed uh, uh, or the person has been dead for, for five years, whichever is the longest period. So the problem is that the, the kind of the rules have changed. Um, but partly because of the move to a 20-year rule, departments don't have the resources to adjust to each change. So you have files in the National Archives which, from the 30s, which are still closed for 100 years because no one has gone back retrospectively, systematically and reviewed them. Um, and depending on what, which time you ask for a review, um, you'll get a different response from government. Um, so, uh, I'm not sure that that's made it particularly clear, but I hope it's sort of slightly clearer than it, it would have been about what the basic structure is. And that, that's, I should say, also my understanding of it. I know there's a huge amount of expertise in this room, and you can tell me if I'm wrong on particular points, or, or where you'd like us to elaborate. Well, thank you very much for that. Um, I mean, that was my experience at Index was that it was very complicated, and that actually the kind of the complication alone was a deterrent for research trying to navigate this. Um, you are writing a book, I think you said, on espionage, and one of the things that our one of the historians we interviewed said was that actually researching the royal family was harder than researching MI5 and the intelligence service. What, what is your kind of experience and your response to that? Well, I mean, a few of us, like uh, Richard Aldrich and Rory Cormack, have sort of moved between intelligence and royal history because we like a challenge, I think. <laughs> and we like that, you know, that rather sort of schoolboyish thrill of cheating the census. And that's how it, you know, that's how it used to, to work um, before, the, before the 90s. Though it's what Stephen Doyle called archaeology. Um, you're looking for little scraps, you know, looking th through large amounts of material for little bits and pieces. And I've said in the past that actually the royals could learn a lesson from the, from the intelligence services, or specifically from MI5, um, who I guess had realized by the 1980s that the only time they ever got into the news was when there was a scandal when there was, sort of, there was a Peter Wright and there was a spy catcher. Um, and that actually a more measured release of files um, would help them to shape their image. And I think MI5 have been tremendously successful in that. And they've released a lot of information, mostly about the subjects of, the, of their investigations rather than about themselves. Um, but, but you know, they have then sort of shaped the way in which historians have gone about researching the intelligence services. Um, for the royal family, um, so much of what we're dealing with is kind of glorified gossip in the way that, it, it, you know, the way that we would research the intelligence services before the 90s, and before the Walter Grave Initiative, the Open Government Initiative, transformed the study of the intelligence services as well. 
And in, in that case, there hasn't been that sort of step back that we saw uh, following the Freedom of Information Act. Well, Anna, I wanted to bring you in here. So you're the principal investigator on a major arts and humanities research council project, the Visible <coughs> Crown, Queen Elizabeth II in the Caribbean, from 1952 to today. Um, and that interrogates the political and cultural significance of Queen Elizabeth in the Caribbean. So a few years ago at Index, we actually published an investigation that looked at how historians and history was being attacked. And we had a academic from the Caribbean writing for us and she spoke about um, the Operation Legacy which ran from the 1950s until the 70s all across the British Caribbean where basically um, ships full of archives were kind of dumped into the ocean and you know lots of material was destroyed of which some I would assume would have related to the Queen. You know how, how is it for you working with this material you know, how sensitive is it and what kind of problems have you encountered? I'm going to pass you the mic. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a big problem. I should say Philip's also um, co-investigator on the project. Um, it's very difficult because, I mean, we're trying, one of the things we're trying to look at is royal tours, how they're curated, the dynamics between uh, the government, both uh, in the, the realms, the government here, the palace, how those um, tours are choreographed and why, where the invitations come from, the dynamics of turning up, how it, how it works out. And obviously, you know, when we, the, the Pape footage or whatever is all just cheering crowds, but actually what are the subtext, what are the complications, what's the other narrative? <coughs> it's really difficult. And we're having to kind of look at, you know, make contact with some of the governor's general's archive to see if we can get stuff there because we can't get stuff here. But I think, I mean, so this is so timely. I mean, I think the importance of this and this discussion can't be overstated. Um, because in a way, this, I mean, there's so many things to say. I think we need to be careful that we don't conflate royal family and monarchy and the kind of gossip of royal family. And that is kind of underpins a lot of the confusion because it's like, well, it affects the family, it's sort of separate. But we're talking about the monarchy. We're talking about, you know, the, the monarch that is head of state. And we're talking about secrecy and silence and um, you know, lack of clarity, lack of accountability, and therefore lack of informed consent. And I think all these things are just really important at the moment. And actually, of course, it's all in the air with not, you know, dare I say, you know, Harry and the challenges he's posed about transparency and accountability. But also just recently when we saw the Church of England talking about doing an investigation into, the, you know, their links with slavery. I mean, the idea that the monarchy in all of these areas can stay silent and close archives off when, yes, there is and the kind of um, gossip that, you know, and, and obviously archive, um, archivists and people like, you know, Philip, who's fantastic in archives, just loves to smell out these kind of, um, you know, these bits of gossip and these tidbits. But the whole thing matters. I mean, the work that The Guardian's done, and you know, journalists are in a sense leading the way here and asking the questions. The whole issue of Queen's consent, how many, more than a thousand laws, um, you know, were scrutinized and were subject to Queen's consent. And, and how disingenuous the narrative has been of this late Queen who never explained, never complained, let's stay above politics. And I don't think it's about whether you're a great supporter of monarchy or not. But I'm just, I think we're in a place where the lack of scrutiny, the lack of uh, clarity is just not sustainable anymore. There's this silence all around, and I think it's a really important and powerful moment, actually. So I commend you for the report right now. Um, yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that we actually observed was the of these kind of 500 plus files. I mean, some of them, <laughs> of them sound quite boring, to be honest. You know, this isn't all... Harry and William having a fight. Um, these are things, you know, some of them pertain to taxation, but ultimately you think, <gasps> firstly, as boring as that might sound, that is actually really, really important. And secondly, why are they locked away then? Why are these, these kind of seemingly boring files on taxation to do with the royal family locked away? So I think these are really, really important. And, and again, we, we did a survey of historians and journalists and you know, we did ask them about the question of privacy, and we potentially, if we have time, we'll go into this later. 
And again, the, you know, this every single historian and journalist we spoke to respects the privacy of royals as a kind of as individuals to an extent. This is just when they've kind of crossed over the line where it's clearly in their public roles and of public interest. So no one's saying we want to, you know, read kind of the path per the personal love letters between this royal to this person at school or something. You know, these again, these are kind of questions of why was there this royal visit? Who paid for it? What happened? What was said? Um, so tell me, what, what happens when you are kind of working in these, with these gaps? You know, what's it like? Yeah, I mean, you have to look, you know, piece things together, um, you know, and come at things in odd ways because there aren't, there aren't direct answers to the questions that you have. And I think just to pick up the point you made, I mean, when challenged about this in the past at different points, you know, the, whether it be the Royal Archive or the Royal Household. I mean, there's statements where it's talked about secrecy is necessary to protect the constitutional position of the monarchy. And we kind of accept that. It's like, I mean, what is that about? You know, this idea that, I mean, of course, if it's individuals and it's sensitive, but actually, I mean, whether it be, you know, the Queen's role around like the Suez crisis or her role in like Northern Ireland, um, I mean, I don't know if we're going on to talk about the kind of Australia example and the work that's been done, where actually, and Andrew Lowney, of course, and it's not just about archives related to the Queen. People having to spend loads of money to actually get archives opened. Um, but actually, even if it is about the Queen, you know, vetoing laws on parking or salmon or something, all of that, we need to know. We Let us decide whether it's irrelevant or not. And it basically means that in our, as historians, um, we're, you know, modern British history has just these huge gaps in it, um, and, and we're just we're just not able to build a proper picture of the position of the monarchy and the idea that it's just completely apolitical. I mean, it's just a nonsense, and we just have to, both as historians but also as journalists, go. That's just nonsense. Um, we've got to ask the questions. It's not sustainable. I think that's you know the silence is noisy in a way. I think that's the kind of paradox. Anne, I wanted to bring you in now because um, Anna just said, you know, you kind of piece things together. And I think your kind of, your story, which sounds very powerful, is about kind of piecing things together. Can you tell the audience a little bit more about the kind of the two books and the Absolutely. research? Shall I use the, yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. Well, I'm not really a royal historian. In fact, I'm not a royal historian at all. Um, I, I'm a biographer and when I wrote a book about Jenny Churchill, which I was researching in 2003, um, the Churchill Archive, um, for which you pay, um, <laughs> if you want to quote, that's another matter. But anyway, they do have a very full set of letters, including the letters, or notes rather, um, from Edward VII to Jenny suggesting that he might call for a cup of tea at five o'clock, and he would really like it if she wore her Japanese kimono without a corset underneath, and various other suggestive letters. But it's half an archive. So I applied to the Royal Archives at Windsor to see if I could um, consult the other half of the correspondence. It's this you know, piecing together problem. And it's also the difficulty that they make. So um, around 2000, when I wrote, you have to send a lot of supplementary evidence as to who you are and what you've done and what you want to know. And I didn't hear anything for at least six months. When I did hear, it was a flat no. Um, I couldn't consult them. I mean, we all know there's no catalog and I couldn't actually ask for what I wanted, but I just wanted correspondence that would match um, what I already knew. And eventually I was told that there isn't room for more than two um, biographers in, in, this, in, in the area where you work. And there was an official biographer at that time, Jane Ridley, writing about Edward VII. She was there about you know, one day a week. <laughs> There's really no reason why we couldn't have overlapped. I know her and uh, we'd have had friendly relations. So that was a flat no. So 
you know, I have to write my book with suggestive phrases, which is not very historical. Um, subsequently, I realized that if Jenny was the woman that the British establishment didn't understand, then Wallace Simpson a thousand times more so. Um, and I had a commission to write a biography of Wallace without knowing what I would find, but was informally advised that having been turned down once, it would be impossible to expect that I, on this terribly sensitive subject of Wallace Simpson and the abdication, not even worth applying. Um, so I went around it, and the National Archives at Kew does have quite a lot of interesting material. I mean, terribly um, secretive. You go into this invigilation room where uh, you're watched with a camera trained on you again, only one person, and they bring out what they think you can um, cope with in a day as to what the staff on the yacht saw in the dirty laundry between Edward and Mrs. Simpson. Um, but, you, you know, it's, it, it's very much not the whole picture we, we know. It's just the letters to the um, complaining to the um, government procurator. And um, uh, so anyway, I, I didn't get, um, I didn't seek permission for Wallace Simpson, partly because the, the other side of the coin is that had they seen what I did subsequently find, um, 15 unpublished letters that the son of um, Ernest Simpson by, with Mary Kirk, born in 1939, led, led me to find letters between Wallace and, and Ernest that clearly proved the whole thing was collusive and letters that were still in their envelopes and nobody had seen that were in private possession. I probably wouldn't have gone out to Mexico to interview the son of Ernest Simpson if I'd had the um, access to, to Windsor. So it, it led me down a different path. And again, the informal advice from people who know the archives is that once they see that you have got that sort of information, you'll be subject to censorship on, on what they do have. So I, I've just left it there. I was trying to do a radio program for Radio 4, and I did get access um, for the radio program, but they brought me Queen Victoria's sketchbooks to look at, and so I have seen this um, narrow space where I would have been de trop alongside um, Jane Ridley, but uh, you know, I've, I've never actually worked there other than this um, attempt to write a radio program as to what they have and what they don't have. So my, my input to this is purely anecdotal um, and I'm not writing a royal book right now, so who knows? Um, that's all I can really add to. And, and you're not writing a royal book right now, is that partly because you were put off by the experience? I've never seen myself as a royal biographer. No, I'm, I'm not. I just... Um, I've, I've moved on to to writing about World War Two, where where there are yes, it is partly because I'm put off by the experience, and I prefer where I where I have access to information more easily. I think. And we were actually in touch with the an archivist at the Royal Archives, asking him a few questions, especially related to Barbados, for example, when those files will become available. Um, and you know, he kind of kept on saying, this is a private archive, and if you want to use any material, you always have to say exactly how you're going to use it, so we know exactly what impact it's going to have. And you know, you say that to journalists, you're like, no. <laughs> you know, that, that is not how transparency works. But, but let me pick up on that. I think, I mean, and, and Philip may well want to add on this. I mean, you know, we're working with partners in the Caribbean, we're working with the University of the West Indies, and, you know, we're UK-funded researchers trying to understand the position and the attitudes and the significance of the Crown during the late Queen's reign. So, you know, there's a sense that we are, you know, we are white people trying to understand the story and the perception and the perspectives of people in the Caribbean. But then there's this sense that there's like, we don't have access to a lot of, you know, there's just withholding. Um, there's this secrecy. We can't, we can't kind of, you know, be transparent and open. And I think, so, you know, when you do get any words out of 
you know, the royal family, the monarchy about, you know, what is it, relationships change, friendships endure, I think, when they talk about the relationship with the, um, with the former realms or the, or the realms. There's a sense that you, there's no transparency, there's no openness to kind of reset these relationships. And I think, you know, I did, I've done work on, you know, the Tudor period, and it's, you know, when Elizabeth I uh, was aging and there was no, you know, this sense that there was a sergeant painter who was controlling her image, and, you know, painters weren't allowed to show her aging. And of course, you know, we think of ourselves, you know, 21st century society, we've got a, you know, thriving democracy-ish, whatever, questions around it. But then we've got this sense that we're accepting um, the narrative of a non-interventionist queen who's never said anything and never intervened and amazing and having a mute head of state and all of these things and secrecy and silence. And then when we do get glimpses of the archive, we know that that's actually not true because there were interventions. But still, the, the press will spend all of their time talking about the royal family and the sensational stuff, but the big questions about influence, power, finance, you know, and at the end of the day, I think the monarchy are kind of shooting themselves in the foot, because actually, you know, if people can't, if it's not an informed consent, then we're kind of being gaslit. And also, then there's crazy things, you're like thinking about how they, the potential future archive. So after all, the Queen's, the funeral of the Queen, and literally the palace are trying to edit how that's going to be released as soon as it's gone out. So it's like, you can't show any, you know, don't re-show images of the royal family crying or whatever. It's just like, well, what? Like they're literally trying to direct the programs just as they're going out in the live coverage or just afterwards. And then of course, all the, produ all the broadcasters get the directive from the palace that they then have to cut and create a one hour summary of all the footage because then it won't be on open access so you can't watch the whole thing back and it's like but why like what's that all about what's the point of that so i mean this attempt to control image i think is entirely kind of self-defeating um but i think maybe possibly i mean historians are getting it i think it's now journalists have to this is the ultimate thing to challenge and question i think I want to go on to journalists in the second part. Philip, I can tell you. No, just, just and I um, mentioned the, the so-called Palace Papers in Australia, and it's great that um, it's a really brilliant special edition. Um, uh, I've only sort of seen it the full thing for the first time today, and it's great. There's, there's a piece by Jenny Hocking uh, from page 59 who, who led this campaign to release the correspondence between the palace and the Governor General of Australia in the 1970s, uh, not, not just at the time of Gough Whitland's dismissal in 1975, but the years surrounding that. Um, and, and finally, uh, in 2020, the Australian courts ruled that these were public records of the Commonwealth of Australia and, and should be released. So we all had a bit of a heyday. I mean, <laughs> too late for my book on monarchy and um, the Commonwealth, but uh, the, there you are. But, but actually, I mean, just a couple of things about that. One, um, the, uh, the sort of the Commonwealth realms and former realms could be the sort of soft underbelly of royal secrecy because there's less deference there. And one of the things, it's not just about law in the UK, it's about the deference of the elites of various, in various positions towards the royal family. Uh, because often people go above and beyond what is legally required to close, close documents. We might talk about that. Um, uh, secondly, actually, there wasn't a smoking gun there. I mean, everything, of course, is, is very carefully ventriloquized through the royal private secretary. And, and Charteris was actually being rather careful in the way that he dealt with the issue. There's no kind of get Whitlam. I mean, you, different historians will have different interpretations of this. But it, it rather goes to show that excessive secrecy can just give uh, further mileage to kind of very extreme conspiracy theories. And seeing the documents themselves help us to get, get a, a more balanced view of what, what is happening here. And what is happening is terribly interesting, because over the Queen's reign, there were dozens of countries which at one stage or another were realms where she was head of state. 
And the palace is a kind of the apex of a kind of a, a completely separate sort of diplomatic network. This is fascinating. It's really fascinating stuff. And we don't know nearly enough about it. The palace letters in Australia gave us a rare glimpse of that really need to know more about it, particularly at the beginning of New Reign, when we're thinking about whether this system is really sustainable. So to you, you know, you mentioned deference, you've mentioned kind of deference in the media, and I know you also wrote at the time of Queen Elizabeth's death, to quote you, you wrote in The Guardian, that she retained an echo of the mystical, age-old, divine right of kings. Her elusive charisma made her both known and unknown. And you also said uh, on Twitter, are some of the press stuck in 1950s deference? deference? Is it time for a reset, both for the good of the monarchy and the media, if both are to be respected? I mean, do, does it feel like we're kind of stuck in this vicious loop where one person's deferent and so another person's deferent and then, you know, there's this kind of, there's this culture of deference, basically, and we can't really get out of it? I mean, I certainly, I think, the, I mean, the media, for me, I mean, okay, you've got the tabloid paparazzi, but the sort of mainstream media, if you can call it that, I think are stuck in this 1950s deference, a relationship that was set at the time when the coronation was broadcast, and it hasn't been revised. I mean, I actually think the monarchy has almost modernised more than the media has. And I know, I mean, I talk to royal editors now, people that work at the BBC, and they're like, yeah, no, I know. Um, you know, the idea that a royal editor isn't like an editor, like a political editor or an economics ed editor who, you know, questions why the value of something looks at both sides has to. It's not about, I mean, it's absolute partiality. It's not impartiality. I mean, there is this deference. And I do think for the good of, for the good of both, it's, I mean, there has to be more questioning. There has to be more, um, more scrutiny. So, yeah, absolutely. So, so obviously we want to caveat that by saying, you know, we did speak to lots of royal um, correspondents who are very frustrated themselves, so it's not, not everyone. I mean, and that's kind of one of the key questions that I'd love to hear what all three panellists think. Like, I can't quite get my head around who are the gatekeepers here, really. Like, is this, we know historically that Princess Margaret, for example, was um, burning letters between Princess Diana and the Queen's mother and there were kind of so-called raiding parties of, um, that Mountbatten went on in the kind of what, 40s and 50s for winds and material in Europe. So we know that there were kind of people within the immediate royal family doing that. Now I can't figure out if it's coming from the royal family or if it's people at the cabinet office. Is it a question of, you know, the kind of the boss would actually say yes, but everyone around the boss is really worried and trying to second guess. What what, what does everyone think on the panel? Well, there are just a lot of layers to get through if if you want any stories. But I I wonder if the deference is seriously because the royal family feel that their position is possibly challenged if more is known, or if it's actually self censorship in in a way. Um, I mean, I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think they definitely, and it's like keeping silent, keeping things secret means that somehow you're, you know, away from scrutiny because you feel vulnerable. I mean, you know, I've sp sort of spoken before about the monarchy's an institution where like EDI legislation, the EDI expectations that every other institution has to sign up to, equality, diversity, inclusivity, nowhere near it. Um, but what's striking to me is, I mean, we've apparently got, you know, free press, blah, blah, blah. But like, if you you would never get a program on the BBC which says the end of the monarchy, or let you know it's time to cancel the monarchy, you just wouldn't. I mean, I've talked to commissioners and stuff. There is this sense of no, we wouldn't do that. Now, there was definitely. I mean, you know, I've talked to journalists, and they're totally frustrated. I don't think any of them thinks this is a good thing. But they're like, well, yeah, but there's not really the mood for it with the Queen. It's kind of seen as disrespectful. She's an old woman. Well, we're over that now. So, is it because? You know, the broadcasters want to be the one who um, broadcasts the King's speech as it is now. You know, are they just really genuinely wanting these tidbits, these bits of access that they're holding out for? And it, I mean, when I sort of talk to them, they kind of go, well, we need kind of collective action. It's because one of them doesn't want to say, well, actually, you know what, this is ridiculous. We're not going to kind of be at your beck and call because then they'll just be written out of the loop on everything and they won't be part yeah. of the royal rotor and all of that. So it needs concerted action, really. I 
think that there's, um, I mean, it's, it's one of those, you know, does the light in the fridge go off when you close the fridge door questions. It's, a, it's difficult to, to sort of untangle. It would be really interesting to know what the palace's reaction was to the 1993 Open Government Initiative and White Paper. But because they changed the rules on the archives in, you know, 2010, we probably won't, won't know for a very long time. Um, but, but presumably there wasn't much resistance and there was quite a liberal <coughs> regime uh, towards the release of historical papers about the royal family. And this guy didn't fall in, um, and everyone seemed to be fairly happy. It's only when you get this kind of, this discourse of rights, of right to see information, and right to see not just his, you know, what we'd all regard as historical papers, but papers generated within, you know, the last few months, that the palace, the palace panic, um, and the shutters come down. And I think this is a kind of where I think historians are, feel a little bit ambivalent, really, that we, you know, we would like there to be a point in time, maybe after 30 years, when almost all documents, whatever their subject, except in very extreme cases, are released. Um, so we can sort of see the picture in the round. And also so that people feel confidence in putting their thoughts on paper. Because if they're worried there's going to be a freedom of information request about anything that they've said or, or done, put on, put on record, the record will just evaporate. People won't, won't be, you know, everything will be done uh, on, by, you know, orally in, in, in person or over the telephone or something. So I, I think that we maybe have a problem with this idea of the right to information, um, and and this is a, this is a point where maybe people would, would, would disagree with me. But I think a kind of a sensible regime for the release of what we would all regard as historical papers after a decent amount of time has passed is something we're all in favour of. And actually, the move to a twenty-year rule hasn't worked particularly well. Um, partly because some departments like the Foreign Office are way behind in the declassification process. But also because 20 years isn't a hell of a long time. As one gets older, one realizes this. Um, it seems like, seems like yesterday. And um, you know, one might, not, might feel a little bit nervous about other people digging in one's files uh, or, or correspondence from 20 years ago. 30 years seems safer. That, that feels like a good place for me to ask one final question before I open it up to the audience, which was, you know, as we said, we've got, we've got a new king. Um, from my knowledge, you know, when Charles was prince, he was getting involved with the Freedom of Information Act, and, you know, this is partly why we are where we are today. So, you know... We, we don't, I don't know much about William, but one of the historians who I spoke to did say that he's potentially even worse than Charles, who was worse than Queen Elizabeth in terms of trying to keep things under lock and key. What, what are people's kind of hopes or fears for life under Charles and potentially William? I mean, I don't think there's any sign that Charles is going to be any different. I mean, you know, looking at sort of the evidence that, you know, Philip was talking about and some of the, you know, issues around the consent um, access that he was also party to, I don't think there's going to be an opening up. But I don't think it's a sustainable position. But of course, the monarchy is a kind of house of cards. You let, I mean, we talk about, you know, the mystique of monarchy and the charisma. Um, we think about Walter Badger, you know, the great constitutional kind of historian journalist. And, you know, he's quoted as if that's like, you know, some kind of God's law, talking about the mystique of money, the magic of monarchy. But that basically just means not questioned, keep away the daylight, because actually, otherwise, it begins to perhaps, you know, people begin to question it. And that's the problem for the monarchy. I, I think it's it's really hard to know what do you... I mean, I think there's a, there is a bit of a middle point. I mean, I think what Philip says is right, and there's certain things there needs to be a time gap before they're released. But then it's like in the moment, the silence in the moment about things too. 
the idea that you have a, have a head of state that is silent. So you have silence in the moment, you have silence and secrecy afterwards. I think that sort of is unsustainable. And talking to, I mean, I did a panel event with some students and they were just saying, the idea of silence from a head of state now feels just like, what well, speak out on certain things, you've got a platform. Um, and therefore things like, that are perhaps seen as, you know, the environment or racism, that shouldn't be seen as sort of political, they should speak out on. So I just think for William, it's gonna be a real challenge to address this idea of transparency, engagement, accountability, consent. But then what that looks like when you've got a, you know, in the system that we've got at the moment. It seems to me like there's a huge appetite for knowledge, and if historians and journalists keep banging away, <coughs> the royal family simply has to realise that it's in their own interests, and I think that's the case that has to be made. That you know, we're back to the half truths and, and, and the books that emerge, and the um, really from 1969 onwards when the documentary was made, and um, you know, Edward wrote his memoirs in 51 and Wallace in 56, there's nothing new about half a story coming out. And surely if the pressure is kept up from historians and journalists, then eventually it'll become clear that actually they're better off. But I think that's not a given. Um, I don't want this to sound macabre, so I'll be careful how I say it. But, but I mean, Charles is in his 70s now. Um, he's certainly not going to reign for 70 years in the way that his, his mother did. And one of the problems around secrecy is that the Queen was so long, you know, was on the throne for such a long time. And so, you know, papers from the 50s are regarded as sensitive because she was still alive. And, and actually, if you go back to the 50s, 1952, there's the authorised biography of George V by, um, um, what's the Reverend? Harold Nicholson. Uh, and then 58, John Wheeler Bennett writes the authorised biography of George VI. They, they're both, although they keep off the private life, and they didn't have much of a private life, I guess, but not, not missing much. But actually, there's a lot of very interesting political stuff you know, published in the early 50s about George V's role in the formation of the national government, in his, his reaction to the Irish Free State in the 20s, you know, only less than 30 years before. And that's because there'd been this sort of turnover. Um, so I think, you know, once those, you know, if those are sort of, you know, we get to sort of King, King William, um, it will be two generations back the Queen's the Queen's reign. And I suspect it will seem then seem kind of safely distant, irrespective of the time span, um, if that if that makes sense. So I think, you know, it, um, I think that's bound that's bound to be the case. And I think it's really interesting reading. Um, you know, because what, what we're interested in is the sort of the relationship between the royal family and power in the UK. And, and the Nicholson books and the Willow Bennett books were in, in a way quite good on that. Great, well I'm gonna open up now to the audience for questions. Um, I don't know if uh, we need to move the mic. Okay, great. Yeah. Great, well let's take the one at the front. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, Stand so you can see. My, uh, my name is Graham Smith. I'm the um, CEO of Republic, and I campaign for the abolition of the monarchy. So uh, we have campaigned on secrecy all around the world as well. And I do think that they're probably right to try and um, keep everything secret because they will probably uh, collapse uh, in scandal if we opened everything up. But my question, really, there was a comment about the um, Commonwealth being uh, the soft underbelly, as it were. But is Scotland also because they didn't introduce? the uh, tightening up of the exemption, so the exemption there isn't absolute. So is there, are there papers and documents that can be accessed through the Scottish FOI Act? Um, and going back on to Jenny Hocking's successful legal challenge, is there a similar, is there scope for a similar uh, legal challenge in the UK if we can identify something we know is in the archives which shouldn't be, uh, the Royal Archives, um, that we could then 
uh, build a case and, and get that extracted. Well, in terms of the <coughs> second question, the panel might know better than me. I mean, all I can say is I know that Andrew Lowney had a kind of a similar case, I suppose, on a level, and he obviously lost a lot of money in a way that Jenny Hawkins wasn't. So I think his example is quite concerning that, you know, if you challenge these different, I mean, in his case, it was University of Southampton. Um, he was massively out of pocket, even though he did win. Um, we ourselves at Index, and I was going to say this at the end, we've, kind of, we've set up a microsite on our website about to end royal secrecy. And we are inviting people to kind of flood the National Archives and things with requests for files. So we're doing that, but that's quite different from a legal challenge. We're just kind of trying to figure out all the different ways in which we can raise the profile and I suppose make it a bit annoying for these files to still be under lock and key. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good point, and potentially, you know, potentially yes to both, but I mean, it's kind of like, why? I mean, yes, individuals could, you know, um, around a particular issue, but I think perhaps, and what you're trying to do, which is to raise a broader point about, you know, why aren't, isn't there a, a sort of more nuanced position on some of these things? So, I think at the moment, what's striking is that this isn't really something that's in the public consciousness it's not in the public debate even though I mean at the moment the monarchy and you know it's everywhere but in the most trivial kind of way and although you know Harry has kind of touched actually on some quite significant issues around you know the press and, and racism and the way in which the palace works and the, the briefing of different households you know some of these bigger questions just aren't being probed yet so I think in a way the bigger challenge is to actually just get the public to be aware of what we don't know it's um, and then, as you say, or sort of en masse ask some of these questions, and hopefully then some serious, you know, journalists will take this up and explore it. What about, do you want to go into the first question about Scotland? I don't particularly, I mean, I think it's an interesting point. I don't know whether Philip or Anne want to, um, just really quickly on, on that. I mean, it, it, again, it, it, it I, I, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of the, the, sort of the Scottish situation. I think it's really interesting. If it doesn't apply, I'm not aware of a, a challenge, but you probably know more, more about that than I do. Um, but even, even some of the stuff that was released um, on the sort of the Queen and the Union of Scotland is really rather interesting. I mean, for example, you know, when she, she famously in, in 1977, during the Silver Jubilee, made a speech about being, and in which she mentioned being mindful, I think her phrase was mindful of the benefits of the union. Um, it was a time when there was some discussions about Scottish devolution. Um, and it's clear from material that was, was sort of released into the National Archives that this was our initiative. And actually the Scottish office was a bit worried about it. And although Jim Callaghan, the Prime Minister, very gallantly took responsibility for the Queen's statement. Um, the palace had been, you know, the, the palace was quite adamant that the Queen wanted this in. And it's another reason why it's really important to have access to the sort of historical archives. I think that was probably the last, sort of the last gasp of the, the major government, you know, open, open government initiative regime. Um, I suspect that a file like that wouldn't have been released now. I, there's a question there from Kate. Thanks, Jemima. Um, I'm Kate Norby. I'm the Deputy Chair of Index on Censorship, and first of all, I want to say thank you so much to all our panel for being here. Um, this is something I've been hoping would definitely happen for a very long time, because it's great to come see it come to fruition. Um, I have a hundred questions I'd love to ask you all afterwards, but first is this, really for Anne, and maybe particularly Anna, I'm interested in what you can add on um, your experiences or understanding of the Crown's attempt to massage and control access to actually earlier periods of history and how we understand the earlier history of the monarchy. I know that the Royal Archives in Windsor we've talked about a bit 
um, I think officially starts in 1760 or it goes back to George III. But I'm thinking, for example, of you know my Ricardian friends, my Richard III obsessive friends are mm -hmm. terribly, terribly excited because they think as there's a new monarch, there might be a change of policy on whether we do DNA testing on the skeletons that are thought to be the princes of the tower. Um, I'm also thinking of access to the royal collections and, in my experience, some early modern books that have the potential to be very important but are personal possessions of the crown. Um, so any light you can shed on that. Looking further back, Yeah, I think earlier is, is definitely for you. I'm afraid I'm very definitely 20th century. But I just do think if you ask the public, um, it, it, if they even know about the, the situation with the Royal Archives or the difference between the Royal Archives and the National Archives, the general public wouldn't be aware that historians and journalists don't have access to it. So I think. It, it, it's a battle for awareness, and if we're looking at what's going on right now with, with Harry, of course he's shining a light on a certain aspect, but there's so much negativity around his, his response that that's not an aspect that's being taken up. But if that were taken up, it might lead to um, an understanding of, of what we can see and, and what we can't see. But um, I'm afraid the, the earlier monarchy, I'm going to have to hand over to you, I can only talk about modern. Well, I mean, Kate, you know, you know, you've worked on that area, you know, you know yourself the early modern period, but I mean, I think there is this sense of, yes, the legislation, but then there's also just this, these attitudes and the gatekeepers, and when you talk to, I mean, the Royal Archives, I mean, it is like a fortress, I mean, it is in like, you know, the Round Tower Windsor Castle, and although they've done, I mean, it kind of amuses me slightly that to make it more accessible to, you know, scholars and academics, they've done a bit of a sort of refurb, but it's really impenetrable. And when you talk to anyone, you know, in the, like the Royal Collection or the Royal Archives, it's really hard to kind of get clear, straight answers. There is just this sense of, mm, yes, but, um, and even, you know, even like, you know, objects and things that are not clearly within the remit of, you know, legislation it's kind of sort of what's appropriate. And there is a sense of, well, this is private. It is, you know, the royal collection, it's secret. It's just this sense of distance mm -hmm. and certainly not any sense of public access and public rights. Um, and I know that the Royal, I mean, when I sort of was talking to the Royal Archivists a few, you know, a few years ago, you know, they were very, very proud of digitizing Queen Victoria's diaries. I mean, it was a massive thing, and they, you know, because it's, this is about accessibility and, this is them doing stuff, but it feels like, but what more can they do? And when you ask them questions, there is so many levels of sign off that has to happen. Um, I mean, I know that when Radio 4 did their, uh, something like Royal Treasures, or I can't remember what it was called, but it was something that was highlighting different objects in the Royal Collection. And the, it took such a long time to get to a point where they could actually be doing that, talking about it, having access to it reproducing the images online. I mean, it's just crazy. So yeah, it's not just modern. It is, there is this gatekeeping that goes on. So essentially, no DNA testing. Oh right yeah, <laughs> but that's so true, because I remember one of the first things that someone said to me when it was um, after the Queen's death is, are we gonna dig up the princes now? Um, so yeah, grin it on. Question there. Do I need a mic? My name is Patrick Reynolds. I feel so from the early part about Queen Elizabeth as being the monarch and also an individual person with a family. Almost as two different people. We've talked a lot about this organization called The Palace. Um, my question is quite simple. What is The Palace? Is it like the Vatican? Uh, who decides? Is, is, the, is the monarch sitting there saying, you can tell us about this and you can tell us about that? Who's running this show? Huh? Yeah, it's a very, I mean, uh, thank you. I mean, actually, the, I think the palace would deny that there was such a thing as the palace. They would say that there was the, the monarch um, or, or the crown. Um, um, but there clearly is 
you know, um, and, and Valentine, you know, read Valentine Lowe's excellent book, Courtiers. Um, al although it's not sort of constructed as a sort of department of, of government, it, it is a very interesting thing um, because it's still, um, it has a particular relationship with, with the, 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 the Westminster government. It has a relationship with the Scottish government. The, the, the Welsh government and it has relationships with you know, 14 other Commonwealth realms um, and, and has had relationships with many other former realms during the, during the Queen's reign and, and the way that that um, operates at, at periods of crisis uh, like the, you know, the, the two coups in Fiji in 1987 when the palace the palace um, acted in a way that was certainly at odds with what Mrs. Thatcher wanted to, to happen um, uh, is, means that it, it is an interesting organisation and I think deserves to be seen as, as, as such. Um, but it, it's very difficult to, you know, to, 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 to get behind and I mean because again you know if you read the correspondence it is usually very carefully phrased uh, and judicious letters sent by private secretaries so it's rather difficult to know what is what is behind it uh, I don't know whether there was a kind of you know someone sat down with a tape, you know, that sat the Queen down with a tape recorder. We know that she has a diary, I mean, she kept a diary. Um, heaven knows when we'll ever see that. Or whether indeed she was a, an interesting diarist. She may have been a very poor diarist, like Louis Mountbatten. Um, but potentially, you know, from any kind of oral history work that they might have, might have done, with access to her diaries, we might get a sense of the start to be able to map those relationships. Um, but it's a very, it's a very good question. Is there, is there this thing called the palace? Um, no, I mean, I think it's, it's, it is the question. I mean, when you said who's yeah. running the show, yeah. that is the question. Yeah. You know, who's running the show? Who's running us? And I think the palace. I mean, it is the thing that often, you know, briefings come from the palace. I mean, you talk about it in, you know, you asked about the comparison to the Vatican. I think it's an interesting one. I think, in, you know, it's, 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 it's inherited convention, it's memories, it's attitudes, it's a culture. Yeah. I mean, you know, whether we like it or not, you know, Harry and Meghan talked about the attitude of the palace, palace officials. People talk about, I mean, and Valentine's a much better place to talk about this, but, you know, the sort of men in grey suits, there's a sense of how it's always been done. It is this kind of buffer, um, and yeah, it's an institution with a voice. You know, when we talk about you know briefing from Downing Street, it is a player in our in our cultural, political, constitutional landscape. But of course, we also now have because of the kind of longevity of uh, the royals, we have really you know palaces within palace. We have courts within you know within the palace. And I mean, one of the things that has been really striking in the kind of recent media wars, if you like, is the I think. Harry really showing how, you know, like 17th century rival courts, you know, the, the Kensington Palace and Clarence House and Buckingham Palace, all of them having their own kind of media, um, well, press departments really. And although there is a head of communications and the communications of Buckingham Palace, clearly they're not in control of all these different rival positions. So, but I think that is the question. What is the palace? Who's the palace? Who's running the palace? Um, how many, you know, who's inside, what's inside, how does it run? Completely um, unclear in many ways. Got, okay, that, there is Martin Bright who's going to ask a question. And Martin Bright actually basically led the investigation into royal sense, secrecy and censorship. Um, and I, I was just his editor and basically made him meet a deadline. So, Martin, uh, what's your question? Yeah, I just wanted to make a quick observation and then and then ask a question. <clears throat> I began the process of looking into this issue being rather agnostic about uh, the royal family, I have to say. I'd, I'd kind of bought the idea that 
Um, the Queen was a largely non-interventionist figure, but uh, um, a largely benign figure, who at the same time had um, done this rather wonderful job of, um, of bringing us from empire to commonwealth. Of course, that's nonsense. The two, the two things are utterly contradictory. You can't be non-interventionist and magically transform our country from an empire to a commonwealth. Um, so due, through the process of, uh, of, of writing uh, the, the, the piece that's in Index on Censorship, I completely changed my mind about, about what's going on here. And I think, I think it is rather serious. Um, uh, what the, the, the palace does rather well <coughs> is allows us to um, uh, develop a narrative of soap opera around the royal family um, that, that hides the fact that uh, they have no, uh, they have no democratic legitimacy, uh, and they are a rather fragile, brittle institution, as we've seen through the, the process of, uh, of of recent events with uh, with Harry. Uh, and I think the work of the various historians that I spoke to um, uh, demonstrates uh, the the importance of trying to shine a light on on what's really going on. Uh, and from tonight's discussion, it strikes me that. At the heart of this is what's going on around the Royal Archives themselves. And I would be interested in hearing some more from the panel about if we do feel this is a serious issue, and a serious historical issue, what status do the Royal Archives have? Where do they fit in in this? How can we breach the secrecy around the Royal Archives? You know, what should we do? Should that be at the centre of our campaign to open things up? Because it strikes me that, that that is an institution that um, is, is medieval in the way it operates. Um, do you want to start? Well, of, of course I think there, sh there should be a campaign and, you know, I can only speak from personal experience and having tried to get a Radio 4 programme off the ground, it's exactly as, as you described. The, the, the BBC are scared, I think, and so, you know, it turned into a, a a programme in which I, I was only marginally involved in of, of looking at Queen Victoria's sketchbooks and diaries and what they brought us. Um, it, you know, again, we know these documents exist and, and I can only tell you how, how, it, how it was for me. Um, I, I met informally, for example, Princess Michael of Kent because um, I'm a member of something called the Biographers Club, which actually Andrew Lamy, who we've mentioned initially set up, and Princess Michael would very much like to see herself as a biographer. So I'm chatting away and thinking, I don't think I'll tell you that I'm writing about Wallace Simpson. And <laughs> I did. And she said, oh, but we met her. And um, my husband will have wonderful documents and letters for you. Um, write to my private secretary, and I'm sure I'll be able to release, um, give, give you some letters as, as to um, our visit. I write and I hear nothing, and I write and hear nothing, and eventually chase it up, and I'm told, actually, um, I was mistaken. These letters don't exist, and they're completely nothing. You know, they're probably not even in the archives. Who knows where they are? But, you know, uh, there's nothing I can do to, to force that. So, yes, I, I just think it's, it's both historians and journalists who, who need to make the public aware um, that <laughs> really not being being shown what obviously exists at a number of, of levels. Yeah, I mean, I would completely agree. And also just like, I think your article is really great. Um, it's a really good article that sort of sums up the issue and how, why import, how important it is. I mean, I think it does all hinge on the Royal Archive, but also it's about control of the narrative, isn't it? And it's about past and present. I mean, sure, historians need to, you know, through freedom of information requests and ask and ask questions about access to the Royal Archive. But journalists aren't asking the questions in the moment now about you know exploring history in real time, um, asking some of these questions. So I think it has to be I think it has to be both. And I, you know, historians and journalists are in a way both charged with in different ways uncovering the truth and asking questions and holding, you know, truth to power and all of these these questions of scrutiny. So, you know, and if historians of the future look back at our press and our media coverage now, they'll be like, well, where were the questions asked? Where is the scrutiny now? Like, we're not creating a better archive 
now we're familiar with the questions, but we're not asking them. Other people that should be are not asking the questions. Instead, they're just reporting such and such went, went here and, you know, cut a ribbon and wore a dress that was Karen Millen, whatever it is, for the fifth time. <laughs> you know, environmental credentials. I kind of sometimes wonder if that's like a magician's sleight of hand. You know? <laughs> look here, look here. Yeah. I mean, of course, you know, that there is this difficulty of distinguishing between what is what is world property and what is state property. And, um, you know, short of the, you know, the republic happening, um, that, that ambiguity will probably remain around the royal, royal archives. Um, I, I, I mean, I think that... What, what constitutional status does that actually have? What, 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 what is it? Well, they would, they would say it's private. A, private, a private, a collection of private papers. They're <coughs> not, not um, public records uh, according to the 1958 Public Records Act. So can you, would you say it's an archive of the royal family rather than an archive of the monarchy? Yeah. And that's the distinction. And, but I, I think that, that you know, that's something that one could, one could press and probably won't get very far. What, what I think is perhaps even more interesting is what happens to private papers in, in the UK, which are not um, public records either. So the papers of prime ministers, for example. So if you, if you try and if you go to the Macmillan papers or the Wilson <coughs> papers in Oxford, um, the Eden papers in, in, in Birmingham, or even sort of big, you know, sort of the, the sort of second rank, Rev, Rev Butler's papers in, in Cambridge, You'll find that the, the cabinet office has swooped down on them and closed stuff, redacted Macmillan's diaries for his, his audiences with the, the Queen. I, I just, a, a little while ago, I just tried to work out what the legal basis of that was, and I couldn't figure it out. Maybe someone, someone cleverer than me here knows that. But I don't, I don't really know what, uh, I mean, that, you know, there are, there are particular regimes for materials dealing with national security, um, which are, are periodically renewed. Um, but this is not about national security. It's about sort of sensitivities of the royal family. And I don't know whether anyone has ever really challenged that systematically. I'd be interested to, to, to see the outcome of the challenge. Graham Wise, I'm Head of Knowledge Exchange here at the University. Um, as I'm the last question, let me just say, first of all, thank you very much for a very interesting uh, uh, session and discussion. Um, do we understand how well or badly we do this by comparison to other constitutional monarchies in liberal democracies? Let's, let's take the European ones. Do we understand the, how the Netherlands do it, how Denmark does it, how Spain does it? different as well because it's a restored monarchy. Um, the, do they have a different legal framework around openness and uh, uh, freedom of information? Do they have a different framework around separating uh, monarch and the, the, the individual, the family? Um, or do they hand, handle it constitutionally by um, not telling the monarch about security matters um, and not having mechanisms like sovereign consent? Uh, I, I, I suppose I'm interested in whether we do it uh, comparatively well or badly, but also if, if they're all roughly the same in this, is it a design fault with constitutional monarchy, as it were, that it, this is going to be a problem if you have that institution? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Anyone in the audience here, Valentine? I don't know. I don't know. I, I've spoken to Republicans from across Europe, sorry. No. I've spoken to Republicans from across Europe, and my understanding is that they are all secretive, <laughs> and that it is a design flaw, because ultimately, if you expose uh, something to the light of day, you don't like what it is, then it's gonna collapse, or you're gonna replace whoever's in office. You can't do that with a hereditary monarchy, so they cover everything up. That is a design flaw. I mean, I would say that because I'm a Republican, but, um, <laughs> um, but yeah, it is common. It, it is the same across Europe, as far as I understand. Very good question. Yeah, it is. Maybe that will be 
part of our next investigation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Really well. Thank you so much for everyone on the panel for coming to speak. That one was really fascinating, um, and I feel it has actually taken what we've done further and. As I kind of hinted at, just jokingly, then this is the beginning for us of this investigation of this project. We would really like to end royal secrecy. I know people have tried. Maybe you know it will actually happen. Hopefully, in our in my lifetime. Um, and we will probably be doing some follow-ups in future issues. Please do check our website, and please do join us for a drink afterwards. Thank you.